Okay, what, hi what hybrid learning is all about in our case is that 50% of us can be in the building at one time. Okay, so you know the, the dial that the health department has that goes from green to orange to yellow to orange to red, okay? So right now we're in the yellow, okay? And if that dial goes up to orange, we have to make some changes in how we bring people into the building, Isn't okay? Two, if you get it to two. Mm -hmm. I think it's, yeah, 2% of the population in the county, yeah. So, and, and the, the health department updates this dial every Wednesday, so I think that's why Mr. Hymas came out with the email yesterday, is that correct, Jordan? I think they, they bring, it, bring it out in the Wednesday morning. Okay, so what happens is if we go up to orange, only 50% of you guys can be in the building at a time, okay? And the way that Mr. Hyman has decided we're gonna do that in our building is those people with the last names A through L, you guys will be here on Monday and Wednesday, and M through Z, you guys will be here on Tuesday and Thursday, okay? And Friday will be, I don't know exactly what he called it in the email, but Friday will almost be almost a makeup day where teachers are gonna be here every single day, but Friday, if you need to come in for some reason, or if you need to contact the teacher Friday is, is sort of a, a day to get caught up and make sure we're all on the same page before we move to the next week, okay? So just to show hands in this class, I'm curious, if you raise your hand if your last name starts with A through L. So it's about half in here, okay? A little bit more than half, okay? And then the rest of you would be here the other days. Here's the, here's the two important things that you guys, have, you guys have to know about this. And you should probably contact your parents and, and let make sure that they got this email. Make sure they check their email so they're aware of this, okay? Um, you don't have to do it right now, but Mr. Hymas sent this out yesterday. So, what happens, this is the important part, what happens on the day that you're learning from home, you're still in school, but you're gonna do like Ryan did and some of the other people who had to be at home for a while, you're still responsible for what's happening at school. So, we'll probably do Google Hangouts, we might do Zoom, we might do recordings, but we're gonna move on with the curriculum. It's not just gonna be, we're gonna have two lessons a week on the days that you're here. We're gonna have five lessons a week, or at least four lessons a week, okay? So when you're learning from home on the days that you don't come to school, you're still responsible to be an active student, okay? Everybody understand that? Okay, I don't know how that's gonna look yet, but that's, that's what has to happen, okay? The, uh, and, and I will tell you, that the most important thing, those of you who have been away from school, would you say that the most important thing about having to stay at home and still being connected with school is making sure you check your email and making sure you check classroom? Okay, that was really important for you guys when you were gone and you did a great job of keeping caught up. You have to get in and see what's going on, okay? You just have to. Okay, here's the last thing, okay, that Mr. Hyman said. If someone is on an IEP or 504 plan, and if you're on that, you know that what it is, your arrangements are gonna be a little bit different than other people, okay? Their special arrangements will be made for you. But here's the other big thing. I don't have the wording, I'd have to pull up the email to look at it, but if students are struggling or failing, you're gonna to have to be here every single day, okay? That way, if you are struggling, we can help you get back to where you need to be. I don't know how they're gonna determine who those people are. I do not know how they're gonna determine, but it's Mr. Hymas's call to say, hey, this isn't working very well with you. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing from home. You have to come every single day. Because I think we have some wiggle room in that 50% where if there's say five people who in the building who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing at home, they can still come to school. Okay, questions about that? Okay, I'm not gonna forward you the email, but ask your parents, okay, because Mr. Hyman sent that email. You can, and you can also 
You can talk to Mr. Hymas about it. That's totally fine to talk to Mr. Hymas about it if you have any questions. Okay? Anything else about that? Okay? That's one of the reasons why I'm going over this with you. I guess I assumed that you all knew how to find directions and read directions for a classroom assignment. I don't know if you were all, some of you were just in a hurry, but it is so very, very important to read each and every direction, okay? And in response to my comments, okay, I might have asked one or more of you to revise your summary. Okay, if I ask you to revise your summary, you can resubmit it, okay? If you miss class, okay, if, if you're absent, okay, we've had people be absent, your assignment is still due just like it always used to be. You miss one day, it's due the next day. You miss two days, you have two days to make it up. That is still the same, okay? So just a reminder, I know it's been a long time since we've all been together, so I wanted to talk about that. All right, okay, so moving forward, speaking about points, okay? We had the, the quiz was, or the, the summary assignment, I made it worth 20 points, which is a lot for a homework assignment. That's a lot, okay? And the quiz that you took yesterday is worth, I think it was worth 34 points. So there's not that much of a difference there. But I also wanna to talk to some of you guys about um, points in my class, okay? I don't know if anybody in this room freaks out about missing one point or two points on an assignment. If that is you, just know that it'll all be okay because there's about 550 points-ish throughout the course of the semester. And if you miss two on a homework assignment or if you miss two on a quiz, it's not gonna hurt you all that much, okay? I am not a teacher who looks to make sure you turned in something and gives you full points. Okay, that doesn't help you become a better writer. It doesn't help you become better at English. I take my time when I'm grading things and I, I tell you what you need to do better the next time. Okay, so don't think you're just gonna get full points just for turning something in. It's not gonna happen, okay? In the same way on your quiz, okay? We still have people who have to take the quiz, so I don't have it back to you yet. But I graded some of your guys' quizzes yesterday, and most of you did pretty well, okay? But know that I took a half point off here, a point off here, because you didn't follow directions, okay? So just know that you have to pace yourselves, you have to read directions, you have to do what you're supposed to do, all right? So don't freak out about 212s. If you didn't get it done, just say, Mr. Kern, I didn't get it done, I'll take the 212, okay? Just do that. It's better than getting very few points in the grade book, okay? And here's the other thing about, about your grade book, and I don't know if I talked to you about this when you were in junior high or not, okay? It's scary when you look in the grade book for some of you to see that you got a 75 or 80% on an assignment. Okay, or a 50% or a 60%, that's kind of scary. But what you have to do is relate it to the number of points that that assignment was worth. Okay, if you got an 80% on a 10 point assignment, you only miss two points, okay? It becomes problematic if you get 60s and 70s and grades you don't like. If the assignment's worth 100 points, right, or 50. Okay, don't let that percentage in power school freak you out. Look at the number of points possible and then say, hey, I only missed a couple points here. I only missed three points out of 20. That's not bad, okay? So tell your parents that too, okay? Because I always have parents come to me, why, why did my kid get a 70% on this assignment? It's like, well, he might have gotten a 70, but he only missed three points, okay? So think about that, okay? As you move forward in high school, you have to think about those such things, and you also have to remember that we're here to get better as students, okay? We're here to get better at writing, at reading, at understanding, and at communicating. That's the thing that my class is all about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start you know, letting you know what you need to do to be better, okay? End of that lecture.
<laughs> questions? If you guys have questions about grading, how I graded those, and you want to talk to me privately, that's totally fine. Okay, I think I explained myself pretty well. If there's something you don't understand, that's fine. Okay, so quiz, when everybody gets their quizzes taken, we will talk about that quiz. All right, we'll see what you guys could have done better on it. You can close your Chromebooks now because we are going to move forward and we're going to read the next story. Okay? We're going to move forward and read the next story. I heard yesterday that some of you. I heard yesterday that some of you have read this story before, correct? St. John people, you know it. Okay? Please do. Okay? So do you guys know this story? I like teaching this story because of the creepy factor. Okay, there's a certain creepiness to it. And if you open your textbook to the monkey's paw, which is on page 24, you will see that all of the pictures associated with monkey's paw, especially that first one, they're dark. I think they're trying to get a, a, a symbol of mysteriousness here on, on page 24. Um, if you look through, all the pictures have the same color tone, actually. They all kind of have a little bit of orange to it, so they kind of have a theme going there with the photos. And at the very, very last page, you can see a teeny tiny little monkey's paw there. And if you go again to the back page, number 34, okay, you can see that one of the things that we're gonna focus on in this story is the structure of it, okay? And you have seen your teachers write this diagram on the board forever, okay? What's this part of this plot diagram called? Anybody remember? I know it's been a while since we've talked about it, Ryan. Exposition. Exposition. And what happens in the ex exposition of the story? At the very beginning of the story, what does the reader find out about? Setting, Setting and characters. Setting and characters. So I'm not going to write this all up here because you guys have had this a bunch of times. Then, this is called what? The rising action. And during the rising action, we find out what the conflict is, and different things happen during the plot to lead up to the top of the pyramid here, which is what? The climax, okay? This is falling action, this is resolution. Okay, a lot of times, is the climax of this story more, is it kind of more like this? where the climax happens, then the falling action is very short, and then the resolution is shortly thereafter. Isn't it usually more like that than the climax being in the middle of the story? Yes, okay? So keep that in mind as we read this one, okay? Our last story, The Leap, I think the climax of the story was probably the end with the rescue during the fire, okay? It's pretty exciting. But it had some major excitement, you know, at the very beginning as well. Okay, so this one's also similar in that it's structured with things building up and some flashbacks and things like that built, building up to a climax. Okay, and one thing I forgot to talk about with this story, if you do know this story, I would ask you not to share specific details with your classmates because it'll kind of ruin it. Got that, Mr. Hits? Got it? All right, cool. I think I asked you that yesterday. And I know you guys would be awesome. Plus, you want them to read the story, right? You don't want to give everything away. So, the monkey's paw, what I like to talk about with this story is the fact that it, it starts in a, in a on a regular dark and stormy night. Okay, so that, that um, page on the left, is, it's really fitting, okay? for what it looks like the night that this story happens. We're gonna find out in creepy stories where the atmosphere and the mood is kind of dark and mysterious, the weather's usually bad, right? And it's usually dark outside. Just like, have you guys 
when you watch movies and there's a funeral in a movie, you notice it's usually raining <laughs> during the funeral if they're at a cemetery or something. Same sort of thing. It's kind of an ominous setting at the beginning and the people in the story live at the end of a street that has not very many houses. I, th I think they even live in the country. So if you guys live in the country and you have a long lane and you don't have a lot of neighbors, you can kind of relate to this, all right? The other thing that's in the story, we got a family with a mom and a dad, and their son lives with them, and their son's grown, okay? So the parents are older. You would probably think of the parents more as grandparents, okay? And the, and the son is older and he still lives with his folks, okay? So at the beginning of the story, the son and the dad are playing chess. That's why we have our chess pieces here. And they're waiting for a visitor to come see them, okay? And I want you guys to think about your own family and your own situation at home when you think about this story because I'm guessing that your parents have friends that they get together with every once in a while and they come over, the, the friends, you might serve them a meal, you might offer them a drink and they sit around and they tell stories, right? You've probably been there, it happens when you're camping, it happens when your parents haven't seen an old friend from a long time. It's the same situation here. They're waiting for their friend to come visit and he's kind of had an, event, an adventurous life, and that's where the fun part of the story comes in, okay? So it's kind of about, the story's kind of about the dynamics of a small, of a family with two parents and a, a, an adult child, and then this long lost friend comes to see them, and then everything changes. That's kind of where the conflict starts, okay? So my plan for today is to read as much of this to you as I can, and I'll probably give you a reading assignment for class four tomorrow. I'll probably have you read part of the middle of the story, and then we'll finish it up together in class tomorrow, okay? So in case I run out of time, that's my plan, okay? Questions? All right, here we go. It's called The Monkey's Paw, and it's by an author, a British author, who is known for his creepy stories. The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs. Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. So they're in Europe, so they kind of give their houses a name. It's just a house, but they call it Laburnum Villa. Father and son were playing chess. The father, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. And that's the other thing about this story. It uses words that are a little bit hard to understand. So if I change some words when I'm reading, that's, that's why I'm trying to help you understand it better. So dad, dad and kid are playing chess, mom's knitting. Hark at the wind, said Mr. White, who having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the son, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Check. I should hardly think that he'd come tonight, said his father with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White with sudden and unlooked for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out of the way places to live in, this is the worst. The pathway's a bog and the road's a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses on the road are lived in, they think that it doesn't matter. So they live on a road that's all mushy and it's got water running down it. Just think about how your roads get when we get a lot of rain. Same thing. Never mind, dear, said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next game. Okay, she knows dad's just going off because he lost the game. Mr. White looked up sharply 
just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. So let me explain that to you just a little bit, okay? In your family, you know that your mom is a certain way, your dad is a certain way, and you and the other parent might look at each other every once in a while and look, give them a look like that. It's like, mom's a little over the top, right? And you kind of give that look to your dad and you guys all just smile and know that that's the way it is. Yes? Yes? You guys do that? Yes. Yeah. That, that used to happen in my house all the time. Brett and my husband would look at each other like, oh, mom's going off again. And then we just move on. So dad's a little over the top if you can relate to that. So dad, dad smiled. He knew they were making fun of him, but he didn't make a big deal about it. Well, there he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste and opening the door was heard talking with the visitor. The new arrival also talked to himself so that, we, so that Mrs. White said, and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady, beady of eye and rubicond of visage. And this is where I always tell my kids to make sure that you look at the footnote. Okay? He has, he's a burly man, which means he's big and stocky. Okay? He has beady eyes. And what's it mean when it says he's rubicond of visage? In the red, in the face. Okay, it's cold outside, it's rainy. That might be why his face is red. There might be other reasons why his face is red. Who knows? We'll find out. And then dad introduces him to the family, saying, This is Sergeant Major Morris. The Sergeant Major shook hands and taking the off seat that was offered to him by the fire watched contentedly while his host got out tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. Tumblers are glasses, okay? They're heating something up over the fire and it's a drink, okay? It's an alcoholic drink. They're gonna start drinking, okay? And they're gonna start telling stories. But remember Hospitable from junior high reading? The White family, yes, is very welcoming. They're, they're going to warm him up. They're going to give him a hot drink, okay? This is what kind of makes me laugh, okay? After the third glass, his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk. The little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and brave deeds of wars and plagues and strange peoples. So he's had three drinks and he's starting to tell his stories. Okay, if you know people that like to do that, they can be pretty entertaining, all right? 21 years of it, said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was just a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. Well, he don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White politely. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man, meaning Mr. White, just to look around a little bit, you know. It's better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and sighing softly, he shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakers and jugglers, said the old man. What was it that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Oh, nothing, said the soldier hastily. Less ways nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw, said Mrs. White curiously. Well, it's just a little bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absentmindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again, and his host filled it for him. To look at, 
said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary little paw, dried up to look like a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and offered it to him. Mrs. White drew it back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what's so special about it, inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son and having examined it, placed it on the table. I have to show you my collection of monkey's paws. Here's my best one. Here's one that's kind of broken. Here's one that's not broken at all. This one's a little odd, okay? Here's a monkey's paw. Yep. You can pass them around. I'm looking for my favorite one here. Just a minute. Aha! Here's my favorite one. This is what I think it really probably kind of looked like. You guys remember Carly Alder? She graduated last year. Carly made that. I like that one. Okay, so this guy carries kind of a little good luck charm in his pocket. Okay, do you guys know what, what a rabbit's foot is? Yeah. Okay, what a rabbit's foot feet supposed to do? It's supposed to give you good luck. So if you think about it like a rabbit's foot, can you still get rabbit's feet like at the fair and stuff? Yes? No? Yes? No? I don't know. That was a big thing when I was a kid. You'd win a prize at the fair and it'd be a rabbit's foot. But in this case, this guy is gross. I know. I don't like that one. I'm going to throw it away. It's a little too weird. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. Pass it the other way. Anyway, this guy is carrying around this monkey's paw in his pocket. And supposedly, it's for good luck. Is it like a real monkey's okay. paw? It is a real monkey's paw. Oh, so can you imagine? So it's like, it's real. So it's a monkey's paw cut off and then just all dried up. Okay, so it's kind of gross. Wait, that one's It's kind of, no, I mean the real one in the story. Okay? So anyway, so this story, this story has a lot of foreshadowing in it, okay? So what we're finding out so far is that the old man, his name's Mr. White, he's really interested in this little monkey's paw that Sergeant Major Morris carries around in his pocket. But I want you to listen very carefully to what Sergeant Major Morris says about it, okay? So listen, we're in the middle of page 26. So what's so special about it, asked Mr. White, as he took it from his son and having examined it, placed it on the table. And when it, they say the word faker, F-A-K-I-R, I think that's a picture of one on the left side there. It's kind of like an old, you guys, come on. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Kind of an old medicine man, I guess you could say, in India. And this is what Sergeant Major Morris says about it. It had a spell put on it by an old faker, said the sergeant major, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. Okay? Think about that. Sergeant Major Morris's manner was so impressive that his listeners were conscious that their light laughter was somewhat jarring. Well, why don't you have three wishes, sir? Said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that middle ages want to regard a youngster. I have had my three wishes, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? Asked Mrs. White. I did, said the Sergeant Major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? 
persisted the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the call. His tones were so grave that a hush fell on the group. Think about that for a second. If someone had the paw and had three wishes to come from the paw and his third wish was for death, what might have his first two wishes have been? What would people normally wish for? Throw something out there. The first thing that popped in your head, Jordan? A fortune? He probably wished that like, he'd live forever and then got like, oh. old and didn't want to live anymore. So. That is, that's really good, right? Wish it, wish that you could live forever, but then you realize that's not as awesome as you thought it was going to be. If you wished for a fortune and fame, could that cause somebody to wish for death? You've heard the stories about people who have won the lottery and don't handle it very well. There could be a lot of different things. Okay, think about what you would wish for, by the way. All right? So this, this last guy, his third wish was for death. Okay? Line three of this page here. <laughs> if you've had your three wishes, if you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Oh, fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have the some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them, and those who do think any of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly, would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw and dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it into the fire. Mr. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. Well, if you don't want it, Morris, said the other, give it to me. I won't, said the friend doggedly. I threw it in the fire. If you want to keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it in the fire again like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it, he inquired. You hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. Dun, dun, dun. It sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Mrs. White, as she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband threw down the talisman from his pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. I'm going to try to get to the end of the page here. Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket and placing chairs motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldier's adventures in India. India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those other stories he's been telling us, said Herbert, as the door closed behind their guest, just in time for him to catch the last train, we aren't going to get much out of it. Did you pay him anything for it, father? inquired Mr. White, Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle, said he, coloring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it, and he pressed me again to throw it away. Okay, put a mark in your book right where I've stopped there. 
Okay. Okay, I am going to have you read the rest of that page. I'm going to have you read section two. All right, and you can stop at the end of section two. So if you want to put a mark at the end of section two, you can do that. So second period stops at the end of section two. Make sure you read it tomorrow in homeroom because otherwise you'll be lost when you get to class, okay? Make sure you read it. They've got this little, it's almost like a, Aladdin's lamp that's gonna grant some three wishes, okay? That's what it's all about.